All right, welcome back to another episode of Cobra Kai Companion, and I am Peter. And you guys, a very special interview today. I know I say that on every episode, but um, this is literally one of my favorite directors of Cobra Kai. He did amazing episodes in season four, but also really great episodes in season five. Coming back for his triumphant return, Joel Nova. How are you doing, sir? (laughs) <laughs> thank you for those words, Peter, and thank you for much for having me here. And it, it's always a great pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, thank thank you so much. Um, so you, you and I, we already kind of uh, talked a little bit right before we started recording. There's not a whole lot you can say. Um, so so we'll, we'll you know whatever you you think you can say, we'll we'll have you say that piece. But uh, we have a bit of a confirmation that you are returning for season six as well. Uh, yes, I'll be helping out on the next season. I cannot reveal anything else, but <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, yeah, that's 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 fantastic news to me. Um, uh, for those that maybe missed it, uh, uh, Joel, you interview or not interviewed? Uh, you directed uh, in season five, um, three full episodes as uh, Ouroboros, um, uh, Bad Eggs, the uh, finale. I'm blanking on the title of the finale. The finale. I'm actually. Blinking on that title, I, I always forget titles. I I, I remember I everything but the finale. Five ten or finale. Five ten. Head of the snake. Head of the snake. Yes. Head that of the was... snake. Okay. And then, and then, <laughs> right. I know. It, uh, I was like, well, I know survivors was nine, but um, and then uh, for episode one, uh, a long, long way from home, you directed the uh the the Mexico sequences. Yes, with Steve. Right. So you yeah, you're all over season five. Um. So again, confirmation that you're returning for season six. Can you talk about like um, uh, kind of the process of being reached out to make a return? We understand that the writer's room opened up just in February. So we're almost two months into their writing process. Uh, Speaking with Michael, uh, Michael Jonathan Smith, um, he had mentioned in season, actually for season five, when they started filming, they only had two full episodes written and the rest were kind of outlined. So um, we don't know where they currently are. Again, we're almost two months in into the writing process. But yeah, can you speak on like how they decided? To, I mean, I, it's almost a no brainer. We got to have Joel back. But can you talk about be, getting that call and, and saying, hey, we would like you back for season six? Yeah, I, I, I think I can talk more, more about because that actually happened on season five, which was the okay. first time that I actually came back. <laughs> and that was a very exciting moment for me because, you know, when we spoke the first time, we were talking about season four and uh, I only did two episodes there. And uh, then for season five, um, the guys, you know, just called me. I think it was, it was for only one episode and then... I, you know, they wanted me to do another episode and then, you know, something happened. So it kind of, it was an organic process. It was, for me, it was actually extremely exciting because as, as you know, I'm a big fan of the show since season one <laughs> and, you know, be, being considered to be part of this family was, it meant a lot to me. And, you know, last year, I also, I can't reveal too much yet about that, but, you know, I, I was a uh, part of obliterated. And, uh, so, you know, I, I feel like I'm part of this family already. And, and, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's an honor for me every time, you know, that they, they ask me to be, to be part of the team. And, you know, you sometimes I feel like you know more than me because, you know, so far we, we, we haven't even started shooting, but, um, and you know it's uh there's always a mix of stuff that you overhear around but I, like I, I think with all the interviews you conduct you i think you <laughs> yeah i'm probably gonna call you to ask you about the season yeah well i appreciate that you know like the i i want people to feel like they can learn from listening to us <laughs> you know not, not 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 just like hey we were able to get somebody on the show when i have somebody that i interview i want people to feel like they're learning you know like this is behind the scenes stuff and so i i, I feel um the value that that i can bring to the fandom is that i can bring our listeners a little bit closer to the show and the people that are involved so but i do believe joel novoa is, is becoming a household name amongst the fandom um i don't want to take anything from any of the other directors but a lot of your episodes like are very action packed 
you know, like like you get some very fun episodes. So we'll we'll definitely go through it. Uh, for those that maybe missed your very first episode, uh, I would definitely um, highly encourage going back because Joelle, you have such an incredible journey. You know, um, leading up to Cobra Kai, just the stories that you shared. Um, you know, like getting the film starting starting with law. Like, like you studied law, you know, to become an attorney and then you pivoted and became a director and then ended up on Cobra Kai and then some other um, uh, fantastic shows as well. Walker, uh, Arrow, um, y- you just did a new one, uh, Fantasy Island, the reboot or is it a reboot or a remake? We're talking Puerto Rico, which is uh, where we that- are part of uh, season uh, five. Was that close by at all? Or I, yeah, I don't, it was actually been. a similar crew and uh, it, it was pretty pretty cool because you know the, the crew we had for both shows was very good in Puerto Rico so it was very cool to be back there <laughs> oh very very nice did you stay there very long at all for for filming your episode yes like um uh, usually w- when we did Cobra Kai I couldn't stay too much because it was close to the holidays and uh, I had already some commitments but when I went back for Fantasy Island I was able to stay a little bit longer and I was able to enjoy what I wanted to enjoy the first time that I was there and have more time to spread out. It's fantastic. Did um how 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 was the you know kind of like the, um the COVID restrictions and and things of that nature? How how are they doing over in Puerto Rico now versus when you were in Cobra Kai the first time? It, it was a big change. Uh, when when we were doing Cobra Kai, it felt like. Everything was pretty much, you know, it, things were not like close to the point that you couldn't go anywhere, but it felt like very much like COVID was hitting. Like um, there was, for example, in the hotel next to us, there was a floor, like a full floor that was like somebody tested positive. So they had to like decide, like get everybody out of the hotel. So it was, it, it was crazy times actually. Season five of Cobra Kai, like season four happened like in, you know, in probably in the worst times. And season five felt a little bit more open. And then the last time I went to Puerto Rico, which was to do Fantasy Island, uh, it felt like it was easing up a little bit more. So it feels like it's a gradual process. Um, but like, you know, it's, uh, I don't know, like most of the shows that I'm going right now, you're back to being able to see people's faces uh, because the masks are becoming optional. Uh, but until some time ago, like, uh, for example, all my journey in Cobra Kai, we've been masked out all the time. So it, if I'm able to see, so there's some people that I have worked with for two or three years and I don't, I, I, I wouldn't be able to recognize their faces. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's a crazy world we are and we, or we were when we were doing those seasons. Fantastic, yeah. So that's that's going to be a, a new experience uh, during filming of season six. Um, so yeah, uh, again, go back and check out that first um, uh, interview with you. And and for those that need a bit of a, a reminder, in um, season four, you directed uh, uh, chicks. No, kicks get chicks. Kicks get said- chicks and match points. And match point. That's correct. And match point again. That's the one where Johnny and Daniel got to spar again on the on the sparring deck. So yeah. that's that's something that a lot of people were waiting second, for for decades. That was my second shooting day on Cobra Kai. I remember. Yes, and then and, and you had to nervous. use your. You 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 and then you. I remember you mentioning that you wanted to do some sort of like a swooping crane shot, right? And and so <laughs> you got to do that. So so awesome. Can't wait to see what else. Um, well, I, I got to do that in in season five. Which uh, oh, well, on season five we on the final fight. Oh, on, okay, uh, okay. Terry, Terry versus Daniel. What? Well, we did it. No, but we oh, yes, it. we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. I, I have Daniel's crane kick written down. So <laughs> let let um so let's uh, start. We'll uh, start off with uh, episode one. Um, the sequences you guys filmed in Puerto Rico. So so you were doing the Mexico storyline. Stephen, is it Stephen Sushita or is it Sushita? Sushita. Sushita, yeah. Sushita. Okay. So Stephen Sushita filmed the um the stuff that was supposed to be California in Atlanta. You were in Puerto Rico for Mexico. So um, what can you share about the, the time f- um, filming in Puerto Rico uh, and also with like uh, EJ Sanchez, who is Miguel's not quite stepbrother, but kind of. Yeah, it, 
that, that was an amazing experience. Like, um, it felt we shot it at the end of the season. So everybody had like a very nice, like, you know, it was like a closure vibe for the, for the season. Um, the cast, like we all, we only had like limited cast going with us. It was only, um, Billy, Sholo and Tanner. And, uh, you know, it, uh, EJ was there and, you know, it was, it was very fun because it felt like the, it was my first time shooting in Cobra Kai. They call, they call this like location shoot. And they every season they have one. They had Japan before, and they had Los Angeles, and they had uh, Miami or Jacksonville. I don't remember. And uh, Jacksonville, yeah, Jacksonville on the so beach. Right? They, they all, always have this like location shoot. It's like a tradition, and it always happens by the end. And I was always like, I was never like a big part of it, and I got to experience that that this for the first time, and. It was pretty cool because you know everybody's like on a on a on a festive mode. It's like everybody's like you know everything is kind of coming to an end. So you kind of feel like you're kind of it's like if it's a it's, it's like the last layer of painting. And I was fortunate to 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 be allowed to do that and to conduct that. I was able to work in my language, which it, it was pretty cool because I was kind of working as like the like. Like I, I could work with the crew in Spanish, and at the same time, I could talk to the actors and to the showrunners in English, and uh, it, it, it was incredible. I remember, like one of my one of my best memories was the surf fight we had, and uh, we, you know, with all the surfers there, and like we were. I remember, like it, one of the things that Puerto Rico has is that it rains around twenty to thirty times a day, so we didn't take that into consideration when we were planning. So. Like, I remember, like, it, it was miraculously, like, we had, like, an hour to do that whole fight because it was raining the whole time. So we were, like, literally running with a camera documentary style, like, next to this incredible beach. And, like, we were, like, I don't know how we pulled that fight. And we had to, like, break the surfboard, which was, like, a double-up surfboard. I was literally, like, running in front of camera and directing with the cameras rolling all the time. And, you know, when you get... When you get the Billy and Tanner and the Sholo or, you know, any of them that you get, you you get good choreography. You get like, um, like you get, it makes your life, you can do a, a choreography that will usually take four or five hours. You can just do it in one hour. And, and, and it was incredible to see that unfold because like nobody was prepared for that amount of rain that day. And like, I remember I was running and with that scene. And then at the same time, we had another scene to shoot that we have to do before the sun was down. And so like, we were like shooting with two cameras and one, uh, a fight. And then, and I had another a camera operator going to, to, uh, to, to the edge of the beach to be able to do this like big emotional scene between Tanner and Billy. And, uh, and Hayden was like helping me out with that while I was doing this here. And it was crazy, but. Puerto Rico has that vibe in which they're they're very good with that. They're very good with like adapting. They're, they're very relaxed and chill, and at the same time, they're good running at last minute, and they are able to achieve incredible stuff in no amount of time. So, like, uh, I, I remember it was me and Don Leflatter Roy, who was the cinematographer for for Puerto Rico, and uh, we were able to adapt very well and to use that in our favor. And, uh, and you know, it, it, I, I don't know. I, I just have such good memories of those. It was only four days or five days that we shot there. And it's probably some of my best memories of the show. It is one of my favorite sequences, the, the fight scene on the beach, because um, one of my favorite lines is when um, Johnny says something to the the Australian surfer guy it was like, you know, something about um, shoving the surfboard up his ass and his friends would be surfing <laughs> him. <laughs> it's a really great line. Michael has, has uh, some, some really good, you know, burns, you know, like, like I think about the past, uh, past seasons where like uh, Nathaniel and Bert, they always had like, some ridiculous things to say to each other. You know, I think about season three where um, it's at the LaRusso house and they open up the door and it's Eagle Fang on one side, Miyagi Do on the other side, Nate and Bert, they said, uh, uh, he's like, I hate your stupid face. And it's like, 
I wouldn't come to your funeral if you, or I would if you died. I wouldn't come to your funeral. So it's just like Michael <laughs> always has like the, the way of words when 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 um they're they're kind of like uh talking trash to one another. So I re- I really like that sequence. Um, what kind of uh, directions did you give to the people that kind of uh worked out in the market? You know, when we see like Hector and um, Maria and Luis kind of walking around uh the town. Yeah, I think that that was one of the big challenges we had coming into it because, you know, as, as you know, like this is supposed to be Mexico and we were shooting it in Puerto Rico, meaning there's, you know, it, it, like Cobra Kai has a huge fandom in everywhere in the world, but in Latin America is one of the, like Mexico, Brazil, I think that those are some of the biggest markets for Argentina too. So... One of the things that I said to John, I remember we, we were driving on a van on a location scout and I, I was not even going to do Puerto Rico at that point. But I, I said to him, like, it's very important to um, be very specific about, about, you know, making this as much Mexico as you can. You already have a limitation that you're shooting it in Puerto Rico, which can look at some part of Mexico. And then at the same, and some of the actors are Puerto Ricans. So, the accent is different. So I think a lot of what we did there was trying to do a little mix and match. Uh, we tried to audition and to bring a couple, a couple of the characters from Mexico. And, uh, so it just became a little bit of a mix of like the way it was not so much like, oh, because if not everybody in Latin America was going to say like, that's Puerto Rican. And the idea was to make it a little bit more, and this is going to be a term that it's not going to be ideal, but we wanted to make it a little bit more confusing. That way it's like, you know, it takes you one second to adapt to know where you are. So the whole market was all built based on a Mexican market. And that's something that we worked. Uh, I work with my, my wife is Mexican, so I was able to, you know, she was kind of like working with the art department team, did, did a great job of trying to supervise that it gets as close as it can to, to Mexico. And then obviously trying to give spoken lines to as much Mexican actors as we can. And we try to do that on the club. We try to do that when, when that scene on which the car is getting like towed. And, you know, that's, that's a Mexican accent. And actually, that's one of the most funny scenes of the season, I think. And, and we achieved that with a Mexican actor. And, and, um, I think with, with, uh, with everybody else, uh, what we tried is to, uh, we had that, um, we tried to kind of go over accents with them. Like uh, my wife was there with me all the time and she was kind of like running the accent, like kind of like perfecting the, the accent, especially for, for the parts that we had control with, which was the ones that we shot in Puerto Rico. And uh, with Luis Jeronimo, it was a little bit easier because he lives in Mexico. And uh, so he had a lot of training. So he was able to bring that authenticity like, like because it was closer to the culture. But I think everybody else did a great job adapting and like, uh, you know, from EJ to, 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 to everybody else was, you know, they were all willing to learn and to, to work with us and achieving the biggest authenticity. And then at the same time, and I know that's what the, the guys care the most about is telling the story and telling the emotional beats. That's why everybody was casted or why everybody was there. So like my goal was to kind of like mix the authenticity elements with the emotional aspects. Yeah, so that that makes a lot of sense that your wife was on set. Um, one one of our listeners is from Mexico. Uh, one of the um one of our younger listeners, and she says everything looked great. The only thing that bothered her, and this is more kind of a like a style preference. She said she wasn't a fan of the filter, you know, to to to, to just to let us know, like, hey, we're Mexico now, you know. She didn't care for that. I think that comes from an Instagram post or a Twitter post that it's been going out for a couple of years. In which they take uh, they take an image of Mexico from all the films, like from from James Bond and from like, right, 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 and, yes. And then they change the filter, and it's like a way of seeing like how every every time you see Mexico, there's like this this filter, and it's sometimes an easy choice for everybody because 
it's just like every, usually you see Mexico as a way of either on flashbacks or as as like origin stories. So everybody like uses that filter as a way of like saying to differentiate that from United States or from Europe, and then it becomes a little bit unbalanced. But yeah, I I, I get that. I I I know what. But but what, that's not bad if, if that's like her only criticism, like over a filter. That's not bad. So I I actually understand. <laughs> but yeah, we had so much, so many things. Like we were like. Like I was like knock every time there was something that was not authentic, we were like knocking it out. Just and I had a uh, Ryan and Eric Berg, who are the you know production designer and our director, were very collaborative. Like they were really aiming to 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 work with us to achieve that authenticity. They they really cared about it, and I think that shows. Oh wow! So so Ryan Berg, he went he went to Puerto Rico as well. Yeah, it was uh, Ryan. And I think Ryan went there. Be- first and then it was Eric who, who who was with us. I think it was Eric, like the whole market. Eric right. was the one that was like knocking stuff down all the time. Is, is, is the Eric his brother? Yes. Okay, Eric's that's right. Brothers and they, yeah, they work together. And that's right. So for maybe newer listeners, uh, Ryan Berg, I interviewed, I think after season two or three, um, he designed a lot of the, the amazing sets, including Miyagi-Do and stuff like that fun episode if you guys love the behind the scenes stuff so um i have one more question about the mexico stuff before we move on to the next episode um so we know a little fun fact that tanner was an extra in in one of the sequences uh wearing a cowboy hat what could you tell us about that (laughs) yeah we were actually i didn't like tanner was there because he was gonna i think we were shooting his scene later uh, but he had nothing to do there. Like he was just visiting set because, you know, everybody was on a chill vibe there and everybody was visiting all the time. And then I'm like shooting a scene. And then I see like I, we had a bunch of extras. And then I think he was like testing a hat on one of the, of one of, of, one of the stands. And like I didn't even realize about it. And then I'm, I'm, I, I go there and I'm like, I get very, a little bit intense sometimes. Like, so I start like yelling a couple of things, not in a bad way, but like just kind of like arra- rearranging a couple of things. And then I look around and I'm going to rearrange who I think is, you know, like somebody who's putting his hat. And then I look, I turn him around and I see Stanner who's like, is there? I didn't even know he just made it into the frame and I didn't even realize about it. <laughs> I realized I'm not moving the, the whole backgrounds. So what you're saying is all we need is a cowboy hat and and stand backwards to be yeah. an extra. <laughs> we'll, we'll make you can it. do that on the next season and just like hide background. Yeah. <laughs> actors are. I um I uh, spoke with uh, Gianni and I forgot how how we came to this this moment, but we were talking about the prison sequence, and I said it would have been funny. Oh, because I think we were talking about Tanner working his way into that uh, that first episode. I said it, it'd be funny if Gianni kind of somehow found himself in the prison scene for for no reason at all. And we're like, wait a minute, is that Dimitri? <laughs> like he's just hiding in the prison scene as an extra. You know, that'd be funny. I, um, I, I just like to do those kind of things. Yeah, everyone sounds like they're always just having a good time. And like season six, with it being the final season, I can only imagine, you know, the pranks that people want to pull or what kind of, you know, chaos will ensue. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of that. <laughs> yeah. So let's let's move on to uh, Ouroboros. Um, you got to introduce Sensei Kim and the Fist. Uh, what can you um, share about filming that that sequence with the uh, at the airport? Well, actually, that on that episode, that's the only scene I didn't shoot. Uh, that was like uh, a montage from season four. You didn't film that either. Oh yeah, on season four. Oh yeah, the, the season four. No, because that was a location shoot. Right. No, but on this episode, um, sometimes things get scheduled in a way that um, that you can't be there for everything, and we had that plane specifically from that day. So, like, we designed it together. I did it with Josh. That was Josh Held. Oh. And what we did was, we, you know, we designed the whole shot. Like we, we all, we wanted to kind of give that heroic moment at the beginning. And usually what happens on those kinds of things, and you'll see when, when we talk about the finale, it was impossible for me to do it all by myself. So I, I actually got a lot of hate and help on that one. And we usually design it together. And then, you know, it's the same, like whoever, whoever the producers sent that day go into it. 
Yeah, it is it, it filmed um it's edited and filmed really sleek and slick. Yeah. You know, like I, I think it's 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 really, really cool. Um shortly after that we uh see Devin with um Topanga and this is where Terry Silver kind of takes over. Uh what can you share uh, about that sequence? Well, that that actually was one of the sequences that I enjoyed the most shooting from that episode, like um because you know all all their energies are incredible and i think that scene is driven by um by terry silver and he he and i work together very well because i love moving the camera around and you know give like a lot of predominance and he he move like he finds his way to camera like he he's he has a natural talent for making your shots shine. And I think that scene was all about, it, it was a, po a power struggle. And it was like, the, the so far, the threats are, you know, the, the stakes are higher and we wanted to reflect that. So what I did with Don, who was a cinematographer, I think, yeah, he was a cinematographer on those two episodes. And like, I, I asked him to please give me like a 360 vibe, which I, I always, I always try to ask the cinematographers for that when possible. That way, you know, you see there's a fluidity to it and we're like dancing around with silver. So I call that scene a uh, Terry Silver's dance. And I think that's, it's all about the beginning of this second part of the season, which I know it started already technically on, on episode five, but this is the beginning of this, of, of this journey. And I wanted to tell that story by by making him threatening and by making everything go according to his dance. And so that scene is all, it's a Terry Silver scene overtaking, like, it's actually a philosophical conflict of ideas because Topanga Karate are like, they believe in good values, but they've never win or they haven't win lately. And then, you know, Terry Silver camps and he ha he's like a he camps like a wolf there and like he comes with his senseis and so it's like when I was shooting the scene I was like I actually want Topanga Karate to succeed like I wanted I I I don't like the ideas that I'm portraying on the scene but at the same time that's what makes that scene so good in my opinion which is that it's a com it's used like I was watching it when I when I was shooting it. And I was watching everything through Tori's point of view. We have those shots on Tori there, like reacting. And and I was like, I was feeling bad. I was like, this is actually all the reason why I love this show, which is it makes your ideas, like it debates your own ideas. And I think that scene contains all that. That's one of one, it's one of my favorite scenes. Yeah, I, I think it's a fantastic episode overall. Um, so right outside Topanga, can you talk about the um, sequence with um, Johnny and Chosen walking through the parking lot, and uh, and also to to add to when they uh, walk in, um, uh, and and that whole fight and, and encounter with Sensei Kim, and still till this day, one of my favorite lines is like, uh, you know, where she's like, "Oh, Chosen Taguchi and Daniel Larusso didn't <laughs> think he would heal so fast or whatever." It was like, "I'm not Daniel Larusso." <laughs> So, so, so some comedy, a little mix of everything, some action, some comedy in there. Yeah, no, I, I, I love that part. I just like as a director, you all, you're always updating your reel, and I just added that scene to my reel because I just really like that comment. It's like, it's like it's and Johnny's answer is incredible. Like, wait, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not Daniel, and um, you know that that walking scene on the on the on the parking lot, which is. It's great because it's one of the first times that we're seeing Yuji and Billy interact. And both of them are incredibly improvising. And uh, and uh, I think, like, I, I had a... This episode was written by Michael, and I had Michael and I had Hayden that day. And uh, they were pretty, like, relaxed with the two of them. So they were, like, playing with it and, you know, kind of like they were... Make, when they started making fun of Daniel... It's like they kind of started taking the scene to an extreme, and you know, it's it's pretty cool when those things happen because you know it's like 
it, it was a combination of good writing and good performance. And then, you know, that fight, I really, I, I, I love all that, like, everything that happened on that, on Topanga, it, I, I, like those two days that we shot there, I was very happy because we shot everything with Devon there and, and Tori and I really like the, all that interaction and how the tension builds. And I think the last thing we shot there was that fight with the senseis. And, and like, I remember shooting that feeling like, wow, this is something that we haven't seen on the show before, which is teaming up Chosen and, um, and Billy, you know, like, I, I sorry, I always, honey, say, yeah, yeah. Actors and mix them with that character. I get it. Oh, I, 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 uh, I worked the red carpet in LA last year in, in April. And, um, in front of Ralph and Billy, I was talking about the, the drunk Johnny scene when, when he says, I love you, Robbie to Miguel. Yes. And so, so when I was talking to, to Billy, I said, Oh, you know, can, can you, um, you know, share your memories from filming the, the, the drunk Billy scene? And, and he looked at me, he goes, drunk johnny i go yeah johnny i'm so sorry like i'm looking at billy so no i totally get it and I, and, you know, <laughs> I'm on camera, so i felt like an idiot but you know we totally get it there's a lot of names and they all end with why you know so very similar sometimes like some days and i'm just like uh for example when we were doing the finale which we'll sp speak later sometimes we had i had i think 20 actors at the same time and i know everybody's name by now because you know we've known each other for a couple of years but like sometimes I was like, okay, so Terry and Daniel and Billy and Tanner and Sholo and and Tori and like I just make like a like a like a guacamole of names in my and I mix Joe, a Mitch, a Khalil. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine when you go to another show after that. So yeah, I, it's it's crazy. It's a lot of names. Yeah, I, I, yeah. The finale has so many characters with a lot of talking uh, parts as well. Um, now, you, uh, also in Ouroboros has one of the most emotional sequences in the entire series. It's when Daniel walks into Mr. Miyagi's room. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think it's spoiler, but uh, I have been in that building. Where is that room? I, I feel they had to have repurposed one of the other rooms because I know there's no kitchen because it, it's, it's smaller in, in terms of the blueprint of the original uh, Miyagi home. Yeah, we had to repurpose the room on the left. Uh, <laughs> that's the only way I can describe it. it, it, then, is, it is it where the um, the rule number one and two is? Is that where? Yeah. Is it that room or or where Miyagi's picture is? It's uh, it's where Miyagi's picture is. Okay, so so that became his room. Yeah, so we we, we repurposed it. There was a build. I actually built. They make they made it bigger. They you know it was a it was an art department decoration thing. Right. They did a fantastic job because I was like, I know that room didn't exist when I was there because I would have taken pictures in there. <laughs> no, that that was specially built for the episode. And I think one of the things um, that was pretty cool is when Ralph, uh, Ralph had an interview a couple of months ago and he, he was talking about his book and he was talking about how we shot that scene. And uh, what we did that day was... Um, like I asked him if I could play the, the the actual music from the from you know the, from the original Karate Kid, and you know the, the flute, the Miyagi's flute, I call it, and um, and uh, he was like, yeah, he was okay with that idea. So what we did is he saw the room like before, but like I was like, I'm not gonna show you how it's gonna feel at the end. That way, when you walk in for the first time, we can be here with the camera and we can actually tell the story of like uh you know ralph coming in to find his memory so we play the music we put some smoke and um and then you know when he walks into that room like it lives like that scene lives like because we treated we we gave it time you show in television you have you're always rushed so you always have i don't know an hour or two hours to do a scene so what we did that day is, uh, like, I fought a little bit with, uh, you know, uh, with uh, another Berg on the team is uh, assistant director Kevin Berg, who's an incredible assistant director. And, like, we fought together about, you know, trying to get a bigger chunk of time to do that scene. And uh, we, you know, uh, Bob, the producer, allowed it. And so we had probably... I don't know, a couple of hours to do it. And 
we took our time with that scene and we were able to like to 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 really live that scene and you know it's uh, Ralph was very thankful for that because you know it felt like it, we honored Mr. Miyagi in the right way and and you know I, when I was watching on the monitor I was almost crying you know I was like wow well, I, I can't believe how good this turned out yeah I I almost want to um kind of just uh, pose a challenge out there find me somebody who did not get emotional during that scene you know, yeah. it's, it's 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 a it's a very memorable um, um, memorable uh, moment from the entire series. I think if you sat somebody down and said, "Hey, give me your five most emotional uh, moments from the series," I, I think that would be one of them. And and probably like you know, Mr. Miyagi's letters, you know, in Okinawa, you know, like the, those two have to be included in 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 some sort of list. So, uh, yeah, f- fantastic. I I think I well uh, well up every time. I see, I see that moment, you know, and having spoken with um, Robert Mark Kamen almost a year ago now, he uh, told me that for the Karate Kid musical, he um, was able to name uh, Miyagi's uh, 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 wife, uh, Kiyoko. And so, you know, when I watched season um, five and that scene came and you're, and you're panning through that the, the room and you see the picture of her, I think it hit me a little bit more emotionally because now I know her name and that's not something that has been revealed on the show yet, but I know that through the musical. So <laughs> yeah. It, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Came in named her after his late uh, mother-in-law. So, oh, wow. yeah. So, so uh, Kyoko Miyagi. So we see the picture. So like all of that, I uh, just, and, and growing up with the, with the film, uh, just like, Oh, stop. Why am I crying? <laughs> yeah. Very emotional. So very well done uh, to, to, to the entire team. Um, we will cut to Bad Eggs, uh, episode seven, which just follows Ouroboros. Uh, can you talk about the Anthony Swirly uh, at the um, in in the bathroom? <laughs> that scene was so funny, and uh, we spent probably a day discussing how was going to be that toilet. So we shot like four different versions of that toilet. We have it clean, we have it a little bit dirty, we have it super dirty, and we have it extremely dirty. Just like that. So we have we have all the variations of that toilet at the end. So, but I think, you know, I think what um that scene, that beginning of the episode, it's it's probably one of the things that I like to do the most, which is when episodes start as a trailer, like for me, the beginning of Bad X is a trailer of the of the season. Because actually they used a lot of that in the trailer and I, and I knew that going into it because it felt like a trailer and that's that's probably one of the things that I like to direct the most because it's like it's visual it's uh, it's a lot of so we have you know everything that happened with Kenny on the mall it's like I think one of the things that I like about this is like the stakes are incredibly high and then but well, you know when you see what's actually happened it's like two kids on a mall in 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 Woodland Hills, like uh, fighting over pamphlets of a karate dojo and like four people like discussing with a map in a car dealership. That's what I love to do the most in the show. Uh, or later on, like huge sword fight in a swimming pool on the valley. It's like, I like to counterpoint the like big stakes with like the valley. <laughs> It's, uh, I live on the valley and, you know, I'm, I'm in Sherman Oak. So, like, every time I, I got like, we, we, I shoot these scenes, like, I'm shooting a big action show. And, and I think, like, community used to do this a lot on, on the, on the, you know, 2009, 2010, which is they took, like, these big stakes and big experiences in a community college. So I like to, I like the idea of, like, doing, like, they did that with Godfellas. I like to do that here with, like, like all my references are like heat for this, like or for this type of thing, or or like big Marvel like <laughs> trailers. But what we're actually shooting is like Kenny uh, <laughs> uh, giving away pamphlets, and you know, uh, and then you know having Larusso throw it to the ground, and you know, it's like it's so good to do this, <laughs> and that's that's. That was incredible to do it. And then it, we had so much fun shooting all that sequence. The bathroom was tiny and we had a, it's like, uh, I think Joe was at, was helming and it was like this whole logistics about 
you know, how we're going to get him in the bathroom. And like, it, 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 it was, it was pretty cool. And I'm, I'm personally a big fan of Kenny's arc and I like to be able to tell part of it. It's pretty good. Um, in the bathroom sequence, obviously we see them holding Griffin going into the bathroom is each time his stunt double when, when they're kind of holding um, uh, Anthony uh, above the toilet? Not always. I think uh, Griffin did a couple of times. And, uh, but no, we, we had uh, like, I think we only had, we only had a double one time. Mm. And uh, it was, uh, the, it was when we were shooting from behind, you know, when, when they're about to get him on the toilet. But we try to tell all that story based on his reaction when he sees the toilet. That's why we did four versions of the toilet. <laughs> it's pretty gross. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it's Coca-Cola and Snickers? It's, I, I think so. I think it's like Coca-Cola with something. There was a very bigger and grosser version of it that, like, I, I like it. Let's go it. I like level two. I know Hayden wanted the level four, which was a little bit <laughs> bigger than what I did. And, uh, but it ended up winning, I think, one of the ones in the middle. Yeah, that's, that's funny. Now, the, the, the trailer sequence you were kind of talking about, this is also where we see, um, Carmen getting her mail, right? And she also has the Cobra Kai. Yeah. Um, what was that in the script as well? Or is that something that okay. you guys came up with? All that was in the script. I think wow. what I try to do is I just try to tell the story, like to raise the stakes uh, as much as I can with my camera and with the performance. And we did a little bit of improv. I, when this episode was happening, I already knew that uh, who was going to be the traitor. So that's why. Is that when you found out was, was, was in the filming of this episode? I didn't know before. I knew that filming this episode. Okay. And I think everybody kind of knew that this episode, like they had an idea, but they were not sure. So yeah, this, is, this is the biggest setup. You know, we see Mitch, you know, uh, you know, at the, at the table and all that stuff, eating the snake bites or whatever it is. Yeah. That, that was actually like, that was a discussion we had that day. Like, because that was, I, I don't know how much was that on the script, but we had the uh, Joe Pirulli and the Luan Thomas, like they were there with that's me. That's their episode, right? That's the, that's the same episode. Yeah. No mercy, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's cool because, you know, every every writer has a, like, I think by this point, I think I've worked with all the writers yep. and I kind of know what what what's their like signature or their stamp when they're writing. So my job is to kind of maximize that stamp. And uh, like uh, Joe and Luan are very visual writers. And uh, so they write a lot of like moments and like, and stuff with like big stakes. And my job when I work with them is trying to kind of like take that and just kind of like even maximize it even more. And that way, you know, they, they their stamp gets a little bit like even more on the on the on on the story, and and um, so you know, I think this episode has a lot of that, and I, they're all fabulous in their way. I can talk for hours about you know, Bob and Michael and Joe and Luan, but you know, they they all have distinct distinguishing styles, and and about the same time, they service the story, but they all all they all have a stamp and. If you look carefully, you can see a stamp of every writer. Um, as a director, um, do you have a preference in in directing uh, a, a script that is as visual as Joe and Lewan versus somebody who may not be as visual, leaving you um, to kind of be a little bit more open with, you know, creativity and and your visual, kind of what you're picturing in your mind when you're reading the script. And I, I actually like to be like challenged in both in all the styles. Mm -hmm. And I think like, for example, like, um, Bob is incredible with the characters. He's like, uh, you know, he's super spot on about like, you know, about the arcs. And, um, and I think M Michael has like a very nice, like overall, like vision of like, of a very balanced way of like telling the stories and advancing the stories and it's very emotional and, and at the same time he's the one that goes to the crazy places like 
for example, we had that moment with uh, with the deep fake that we did with um, with uh, Johnny. It's on my notes. <laughs> that, so the, I think uh, you know he goes he goes more to those extremes, and I think what I'd like to do here, and you know, as a director, is for me, it's like when you're coming into worlds that are already written, it's like you become part of that world, and you kind of like offer suggestions and offer ideas and and try to kind of like they call this elevate i call it probably like i don't know collaborate but i like the fact of like finding everybody's stamp and making it great like i want them to be proud of their episodes so like for me it's very interesting and very fun because it's like especially when they're on set and this show and in this show they're always on set and I think that's incredible because you get to experience their personalities and also they all allow you know they all allow me to they, they by this point they trust me so they allow me to do like go go a little bit crazy what what they do but at the same time they keep it grounded so sometimes I may have a crazy idea that it's probably too crazy and then they'll probably keep it a little bit grounded and I think that's necessary so I think like with each of them I have learned a lot and and uh, I think like all of them are like incredible authors and they're they're they all I'm sure that in the future they're all going to be directors yeah I, I I mean I would love to see like yeah anything else that they can write or, or direct themselves for sure especially like 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 um Michael like I I'm I'm curious to see if he has any, uh, you know, if he has any desires to 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 direct. Even with season six, I I, I was kind of wondering. It sounds like maybe you guys have already all been reached out, or at least given a heads up. Hey, we're gonna reach back out and have you guys come in, kind of thing. With Ralph and Billy, they both have directed. I I had wondered, like you know, for a few seasons now, would they ever direct any episodes before the show ends? So I, you may not have an answer, but I do wonder if we'll be surprised and be like, wow, one of them actually did direct an episode or something like that. So I guess we'll wait and see as to the I guys. Like wait for, for that, but I'm not, but yes, I'm, I'm, eh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure everybody's going to have a nice journey in this show and on the possible spin-offs in the future. And it's like, I think, I think this is a family that it's going to keep growing. Those um sound very specific words. <laughs> Possible spin-offs, a family keep growing. Okay, okay, all right. Um let's see, uh, can you share uh any insight on the uh chosen and the exercises? Uh, you know, because there's a point where we saw chosen, I don't know if Yuji did it, chosen with the nunchucks and hitting the egg, um, throwing the little arrowheads or whatever those those little weapons are. Uh, can you share uh, fil- filming that and um, chosen uh, uh, kind of teaching the kids, basically? Yes, we... Um, that was so fun to, to shoot because, uh, you know, y- Yuji is incredible. Like, he's... Uh, he- he's very prepared. He's like super spot on super like he wants to know everything like he puts the time and the effort usually when he's going to shoot a scene the next day he'll usually come the day before uh, or days before with ideas and with like but not only ideas for the writers but also for, for staging ideas and like he he likes to know he's a perfectionist so we try to curate all the sequence for that and it was very nice you know it was like something it, usually episodes it, it, when you have a 10 episode order episode 7 is a very challenging episode because it's not the beginning it's not the midpoint and it's not the end it's like in the middle of everything and um, in the middle of the back part so it's like it's a difficult and challenging episode I always admire the writers that, that, that do these episodes and the directors and the challenge was how to make how to make it engaging, how to still make it fun, and uh, and how to advance the story at the same time. And I think like a lot of that came from the pacing of all this. You know, it's like um, this idea which came from uh, Joe and Luan 
um, about this kind of the, the, the circle theory. And, and I'm sure the guys also kind of, you know, usually in the writer's room, I don't know what happens there, but something happens. And then, and then they had this kind of circle. They we're introducing the circle kind of thing that it's going to be uh, pivotal for the ending. So um, I think like shooting all that and make it, it's like it gives levity and at the same time, we always try to shoot it with the stakes high. So even if we're shooting a levity scene in which, you know, it's like chosen, like attacking kids, which like if I had kids, I wouldn't really let them go with chosen being attacked with nunchucks. But like... It would be I, chosen it, over Sensei Kim. Yes, so Sensei Kim, there's a lot of things that I wouldn't do, but like for the sake of the show, it was pretty awesome and pretty cool. Yes. And uh, and uh, I think at the end, like what we were trying to do is like these eggs are like treated as something more like that. You know, it's like these eggs are your kid's life. So if you if you shoot it that way, then it becomes serious and it becomes more fun. The more serious a scene is, the more fun it's going to be. The more stakes there is, even in levity moments, the more fun it's going to be. And uh, and then we had all sorts of like stuff like Dimitri's egg breaking. It was like a whole mechanism of like the egg breaking, and it was like a special effect. It was rigged for it. And uh, Gianni always has this talent for like telling like seven sentences in ten seconds. I don't know how he does it. He's incredible for like uh, for 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 those kind of scenes. So you know, it was pretty. It came pretty easy. And one of the things that I liked the most on all this it was, I think it was the first time that we gave power to Griffin and. Telling that story there was for me the main focus. It was like, you know, how is Griffin living this and how is Griffin coming up with this idea here? And I think like, you know, it, it was, it was pretty cool to see him grow because I've seen him on the show since he was a kid. And now he's this kind of mature kid who in real life, he's like that, you know, he's, he's fun, but he's also like smart and. So you you see that and that's coming to life on this episode and and that was pretty cool to direct. Well, before we uh, we move on to um uh, one more sequence of um, episode seven, uh, maybe a couple questions if you can shed some light on. So during the egg sequence, chosen somehow took Sam's egg out of her bag. Are we just uh? It's a little bit of like chosen magic, right? Like he's just you know like nin- ninja style, like he just. Uh, any explanation to that? Basically, that's just just magic. I think. Well, are you talking about when he steals the egg in the inside the? It, yeah, they're inside Miyagi Do, and and Sam has and her bag it. open, and and the egg's already gone, and Chosen has it. Yeah. Yeah, I think I don't know if that made it to the cut, but what we did, like I, I always try to do this to make it realistic, is we actually shot the moment in which Chosen kind of appeared in the background and really stole it. Because I, I like, I said it's not gonna make it to the cut, but like you know, like let's just have him really steal it. So I think when I was editing it, I remember like I you, you really see his shadow in the background. I completely forgot. I saw I saw the show a couple of months back, and I just don't remember if that made it to the to the actual cut. But if you like in some of the footage, he's always like you see him passing by and actually grabbing the egg. So. I think like the idea is like kind of like a little bit of like my inspiration for all these scenes are like some old samurai movies. Uh, actually, there's a shot of like Chosen coming in that I all that I compared to Seven Samurai, like with the mist. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Yeah, so it's got like visually. Uh, I this episode for me seems like a like a like a standalone. Like I, it's probably one of the ones that I'm the most proud visually. Oh yeah, you know, there's some beautiful sequences for sure. Um, so I now I'm kind of almost picturing like in Bloodsport, you know, where uh, Van Damme's character Frank Dukes, you know, he's doing the the thing where he's holding a coin in his hand, 
and or, or the the other guy's holding the coin in hand and he has to grab it real quick. So I want to see those sequences of like chosen in, in the background. So the kids <laughs> just they, they just didn't see him hiding and hiding in the shadows, I guess. Um we'll come back to to that beautiful shot in the backyard, um, which you credited uh, the 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 cinematographer and yeah, adding smoke and filming like a certain type of day kind of thing. Uh, one of the other things I know, I know I will at least get one question like, hey, how come you didn't ask about this? So all the different times that the kids were hiding all around Miyagi-Do, inside, outside, nobody found the necklace, um, Sam's necklace uh, out there in the bushes. <laughs> Did that I, come up at all? Like, I feel like it had to have come have, up. I think Joe or Luan brought it up at some point. And then we were like, like it does do those the thing is like there's conversations like that like 10 times a day because there's so much things happening and so much story striking at the same time so it always comes up and and then there's always like you know I, <laughs> it's probably somewhere there that nobody like it's a, it's a big enough yard for them <laughs> Yeah, it's just one of those things that I know that we had to just kind of like let it go. But there, there's going to be some people that that I know that that wanted answers. Like, well, how come Sam just uh, just found it because she dropped uh, her water bottle, but nobody else saw it when they were hiding with their eggs? Probably yeah. they were they were focusing on the cycle with the nunchucks coming. Probably out. yeah, that's it. Cycle with the nunchucks. I I, I like that answer. Um, so yeah, just a, a little bit more of the the, the, the the you know your your influence of Seven Samurai and seeing. Uh, chosen running in slow mo with the bow staff, just it's it, it's an incredible shot. That that's one that's again you know, um, this in this episode you know it was also Kevin Berg the assistant director like we we tried to give to shoot that very early morning where the actual the real mist was there and um we gave it some time and one of the things that don the cinematographer did there was he bounced the smoke to the little water fountain and i didn't know that you could achieve that and like like what you see is usually a lot of films have smoke and smoke it's tricky like working with smoke is very tricky and most cinematographers have a difficult time working with smoke so what what Don did pretty well was that he bounced it with the water, and I think he's done it before in another film, and he suggested that idea, and I because I, I wanted that I had this kind of reference board and I had that, and um, and he achieved it to perfection, and I was like blown away by that shot. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 so good, and the lighting and and everything. Um, what, what was the temperature like that day? That day, it, it was actually, we had good weather for those shows and scenes. I remember compared to the fight with Daniel and, and uh, Billy, Very like, cold. that was freezing. This was actually good. I okay. think we shot this in... Well, probably like in the fall, huh? It was October or... It was before yeah. it got freezing because the finale was freezing. That was right. crazy freezing. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, because because by then you guys were like in December, I, I would imagine. Yeah. So the the last sequence in that episode, we get a flashback to South Korea with um, uh, Barrett and Nick uh, playing young uh, Chris and Terry Silver. So we also have Don Lee, who is the fight choreographer, playing Master Kim, and then we have little uh, is it Sarah Ann? I, I believe is her name, who plays a uh, uh, young um, Sensei Kim. So yeah, just talk about like. Uh, reading that on page and, and your guys' idea of, of bringing this to life. Yeah, I think that was when 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 I read it on the page, you know, it's one of those flashbacks that the reason I liked it was because it tells a story about a specific period of time, which is, it's before the film, but not so much before the film, the actual, you know, uh, the first film. So it was like a like I always like kind of like filling the blanks, and that was pretty cool to to you know to 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 get the opportunity to do that, and also to give uh, an origin story to Sensei Kim, and also like it it has multiple purposes, and we found this incredible location uh, on the woods close to Atlanta, and it was actually pretty close to the to the shopping mall. I don't know why the shopping mall and that location were so close. And this is uh, uh, the shopping mall from season two. It's kind of like abandoned. Or... For, for the trailer, for the 
beginning five minutes oh, of okay. it. Okay, got it. We shot those that the same day. But I think like that look, it had like a Mortal Kombat vibe. Yes. And yeah. uh, that's a little bit what we aimed for. We had a, that was a challenging scene because we had a lot of things to take care of. Like, for example, we couldn't see Master Kim's face. We, what was that about? Yeah, because it, it did seem like you guys were trying to keep it more mysterious. Yeah. Keep it more a, mythical. Yeah, I think there's two reasons. One is a creative reasons, which is like probably, you know, kind of make it mysterious, make, make it make it moody, make it mythical. And at the same time, you know, you're you don't wanna there's stuff there's stuff still to be revealed. Okay, I see. Happens. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, I don't know if that's one of them because I don't I don't know anything, but it's probably one of them. And um and I think um I think like uh we had that obstacle, then we had the obstacle of hiding little Sensei Kim and all and so you know we had we had to work around those elements. We had this incredible location and you know we had also that was Don again with the smoke. I think he's like a master of the smoke and he was like bouncing it all over the trees, like he's very good with that. And um and we were able to achieve a very nice sequence, I think. And and obviously the choreography. I never talk about the choreography because the choreographies are always incredible. So that's that's kind of a given on the show. <laughs> and uh and I think that's uh you know that's a, a mix of uh, Ken and Don, you know, they they work together very, very well. And you know, I I, I don't acknowledge too much because it's already it's already there and you know it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it, it's it, it's really um, interesting. And one of the questions I have that I, I hope gets answered in season six is just like, how do we, how does Crease in that episode end up the Crease in the movie in the first movie? You know, like I, I feel a lot has to ha- has to happen to change this man to the, to to we get there. Yeah. Um, unless you have any other, uh, so, so before we move to f- the finale, if you have any un- other insights to the previous episodes or like uh, deleted scenes or alternate takes that we don't know about, well, I think I think that episode most mo- mostly everything made it to the final cut. Uh, we have all that prison arc that all made it to the cut, and that was you know uh, something that we were able to to achieve you know, with the crease. And one of the things I had the privilege and decision to tell mostly all of Chris's story, except a couple of scenes on the finale, but I was able to, to, to kind of tell that whole art. And it was something, you know, it, it was, we had that prison fight and we have all that, all that kind of uh, art with Tori and then with Daniel. And, you know, we always try to keep it interesting and, you know, shooting with them is always fun. So, it's uh i think th- th- these episodes were packed i i remember everything like a it feels like a like an intense trip if you know what yeah. i mean. oh sure like, almost every episode was filmed like a movie you know it's just, it's, it's incredible i don't know i i think you did i don't know if you read it but but i i remember when I wrote my non-spoiler review for season five before it came out, I remember you replying with some fire emojis. I assumed you read it, but um, <laughs> yeah. So I was just like, uh, it could, because the headline of my article was uh, season something like season five of Cobra Kai is the best Karate Kid sequel, <laughs> you know, because yeah. it, it just it feels like a movie. It's just it just feels like a like a five hour movie. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's talk about the finale, Head of the Snake. Uh, starting off with Crease's fate. I was fooled. Some people out there, they didn't think that that was real. Um, kudos on them. But I, 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 I really thought that Crease died. Yes, that's uh, that's one of the the scenes I w- I co-directed that scene with Hayden, and uh, I think uh, we prepared that a lot. Like I, I think I've told you last time. Like I, I worked. My wife and I, we work together and we try to prepare everything and try to kind of like reference everything with like everything we can, you know, bringing clips from other films and bringing music and bringing in everything we, we can. And, and I think those, uh, all, all that Chris arc, we try to, 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 we try to curate it as its own story, as its own, like, you know, uh, 
has its own art and we wanted it to feel we knew like it's difficult to be fooled because you people know it's not the final decision and and usually when you're going to kill a character it's usually a little bit later in the episode so that's your game of thrones you kill them every episode yeah. <laughs> but usually it's like i don't know killing Chris is a big deal and and i think like we tried to tell it as realistic as we could, but we, we knew it's going to be like 50 and 50 in terms of like, and, but we gave it like that ending, you know, that little crane shot at the end, trying to kind of like, like we wanted to treat it as a closure scene. Like we wanted to treat it as this is Chris's last scene. Like what would happen if this was his last scene and there was no other scene after. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess the, the other reason that the 50%, you know, that, that, bought into what was actually happening and not fooled was because Hayden tweeted out, you know, like last year, oh, there comes a time when you have to kill off your a, a favorite character or something. <laughs> so so we're just like, oh, they're killing off a character. So for the longest time, my theory was it was going to be chosen. Basically, um, I, I think I had that theory since season three that like at some point chosen was going to die. And then when he didn't show up till season four until the end, I kind of stopped thinking about that. But then when Hayden was on Twitter trolling everybody yeah. and I went on Martin Cove's podcast with his his twins and I even shared, you know, my thoughts about season five. I go, I think I think Chosen's going to die. <laughs> That's what I told him. And and it, there's, a, there's a funny moment where I referenced uh, Captain Turner and Martin Cove. Um, he kind of chuckles. He's like, Captain Turner, you know, like he was amused. That I remember the name and I didn't know Captain Turner was going to show back up in your episode. Um yeah. I, I guess I kind of skipped over it, but you, you did briefly mention the deep fake. Um, you know, we had a, a stand in. I'm forgetting the actor's name, but I do follow him on Instagram. And so what I understand from John's tweets is that uh, you guys ended up um, having Billy record the voice as well and just kind of uh, changing it up a little bit. But what about filming that scene? Well, that was, that was that was a very interesting one because I have never done that in my life. And uh, that was my first thing when I read the script and we had that first meeting. I was like, this is fun for me because I've never did done anything like close to this. So I think as a director, one of the one of the strong points is always to admit when you haven't done anything because then you can get a support group around you kind of like that that's done similar things. So we hired a company that's done it many times before and they wanted to have you know, somebody that looked, looked like him. So we had him, the, the standing, you know, he, he, he was actually an actor and he, he did, he did great and he looked very similar. But I, I suggested when we were in that meeting, I suggested we should also do that with Billy because you never know. And like I was talking, at, I had no visual idea about anything of this. I was talking out of intuition. I was like, if we do this with, with the actor, but we also do it with Billy then probably there's stuff in the way Billy's face moves that they would prefer. So we shot it with the actor and then we shot it with Billy. And so it's obviously Billy's voice. And, um, but I don't know which of the two ended up, but because that's a decision that usually the VFX team will make, but we provide them both options. My feeling is that they will probably pick the Billy's one because, uh, because of the, expression like uh you know you can everything changes on a face but they like and i watched a lot of tutorials and i watched everything they did on the irish man and that was my whole education on this <laughs> that's that's all i had coming yeah. into it so, so so basically if it was billy you guys were to dh him like like marvel and irish man you know, like like the Marvel movies. Yeah. Okay. So that's interesting. And going with the younger actor, that would just be a regular deep fake, obviously. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. So I mean, it it it, it turned out great, and I think most of the fandom, because I know my reaction when I first saw that, I nearly fell out of my seat. I go, wait, wait, what the hell is that? I was like, is this <laughs> something? Is this old footage I have never seen before? That's what I immediately went to because that's how well, that's how great it looked. They did, they did it incredible. I think that was one of the things that they knew coming into the season that they wanted to prioritize. So, you know, they gave special attention to that. They had a great team, like a specific deep fake team. So it's like, I think when they come into the seasons on the writer's room, there's a couple of discussions that they have. And that's 
the things that are the most important in technically and budget wise. And then when they come into the season, they all, all the writers know that and they transfer that information to us as directors. So like we all know coming in like on, on our episodes, what what is it that is special about it? And we try to kind of execute it to perfection or or as best as it can. And I know that we, all the directors, we, we all know each other on the show by now. And I know that's the case for everybody. Wow. Um, so as a Chris's fate, we talked about that. Now let's talk about um uh, Mike Barnes kidnapping our heroes. So I, I don't know if you saw my comparison, but um uh, seeing them out on the road like that, it, it kind of reminded me of the first Avengers movie where they're in the forest where Thor meets Captain America, yeah, uh, and Iron Man. It was that an inspiration or was that kind of coincidental? It happened organically, like I think what we wanted to do there was, uh, I think the challenge for that scene was, it was like a, it, it was the first time that we see everyone. Like, I think you've never seen all of them together. Oh. And because, and so it was like, okay, so we want to give special importance to that, but at the same time, they're absolutely wasted. Yes. So <laughs> it's like, okay, so how do I balance the comedy? and the high stakes of the scene. So when we were shooting, I was actually, I was insecure about that scene when I was shooting it because I was, I was like, am I getting the tone right on this? Like, I think, I, I think one of my reassurances there was that like the guys were passing by that day and they saw when that I was directing that scene and they were like, oh, and they loved it. And I was like, oh, okay, so I must be doing it well. And then obviously in the editing room, it came together very well at Beastly. But when I was shooting that scene, I was, I didn't know if I was hitting the right tone. I didn't know, even as a fan of the film and as a fan of the show, I didn't know if I was doing it right when I was doing it. Uh, I don't know. I'm sharing a moment of insecurity that I had. <laughs> oh, you know, that's just you being honest. And, and I, I think, you know, as, as, uh, viewers of the show we appreciate something like that you know like i told ralph when he released his book there's something that he shares in there that that um something that was personal to him about like uh being asked to be a presenter at the academy awards the night that pat Morita, you know was uh was in the running for best supporting role and like in hindsight ralph wished that he could have gone back and 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 go and be a, a presenter so he could have been there with with Pat that night kind of thing. So, you know, and I told him, like, I, I appreciate you sharing that. That that's not something that most people would just put out there. You know, we're all humans. Well that yeah, that that, that I, I'm I'm reading the book now. I, I just bought it last week and it's incredible. It's like has so many it's fantastic. I think um I, I, I bought it on Audible. I, I have the physical copy, but I listened to it on Audible like three times. <laughs> Cause it, it, it feels like Ralph sitting there just just telling me these stories, you know. So um, now you mentioned that you and your wife, like, you know, sometimes you guys uh, incorporate like inspirations from other films or, or or the music from other films. Um a lot of the sequences of like Daniel outside after being kidnapped, even left alone in the dust after you know mike barnes takes off kind of thing i felt there was a lot of maybe i don't know if you want to call them parallels but there's a few instances that just reminded me of back to the future i don't know if any come to your mind specifically or if there was any inspiration from that for those things we used two references i think we used uh we used back to the future and we also used an and there's a film that came two or three years ago called nocturnal animals i think um, oh, what is it called? Nocturnal Animals. I think it's it's Tom Ford's film. The oh, one about is it stop motion or something? Or no, oh, it's 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 all about it, it's a, like a nightmare, and it, it it has a car in the middle of nowhere, and then the characters okay. walk out. So we we used a lot visually. We used a lot of that, and uh, and tonally, we used a lot of Back to the Future. Yes, yeah. So um, because the, the, there's one obviously the 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 Johnny saying hey keep, keep, get your damn hands off him, but um like when Daniel finds the guy who's taking a leak outside of his truck and the way like Bob and the other guys the way they come out of the car was like Marty 
you know, being thrown into the trunk and then like the musicians get out of the car. Like I, I saw, I was just like, I, am I seeing uh, that or, or is that intentional? I want to fall back to the future reference. And uh, there's a funny story about that one that I'm not, if, I don't know if Bob told you, but I, uh, I gave, you know, Bob what, what was going to act on that scene. And on the last one, I was like, I gave him a, uh, like, a, yeah, but I gave him an empty can of beer and, I don't think he he has forgiven me about about it, but he. I was like when when you know when the car is going away, just like throw this can at this car and just try to hit it, and then he threw the can and just did this. Oh, because it's, it's empty. Yeah, because it's empty. We just shot it one time, and and it it made it to the cut. Like if you yeah. you, you see the cut, you'll see Bob throwing an empty can, and and it it like it looks a little bit weird for the character. It's super. Well, fun. I mean. It, that's no, funny. No, 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 well, the the funny thing is, you know that it's empty, so 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 like the obviously the, the the weight of it looks off, right? As a viewer, I don't I don't know that insight. So like to me, I just assume that like that character wants to throw an empty can because that's all he can reach for or already had. You know, like maybe he just finished that. So th that's all that it looked like. I think there's so. enough potential on that character. Yeah. I, th I think so. Like I, I didn't. I don't. I don't know if I recognized them at first. Mm -hmm. I, I think I um somebody mentioned something. I had to kind of go back, kind of <laughs> thing. So it's one of those things. Like I, I do like to look at extras just to see who I might recognize, you know, mm -hmm. or something like that. Like um, Michael, he mentioned that he was supposed to be in one of the scenes in episode nine when um Stingray is playing uh, uh Dungeons and Dojos and Dungeons. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, that's that's always fun to see. Uh, speaking of Stingray, um, r rescuing Daniel, a, a, a lot of uh, uh, Terminator quotes. Um, can can you talk about like Stingray uh, rescuing Daniel? Yes, I I think that I think Stingray is, is is something that you know every time you have him, you know he's he's an amazing actor, and you know he brings a lot to the table, and he takes the words on the script and he makes them his and he improvises with that and he gives you like 30 different options and then you can pick one. And I think every, every shooting with him is very fun. And uh, I think that moment when he arrived with the car, he's like, Mr. LaRusso, come with me if you want to. That, for me, that, that scene is gold. And, and then it, you were asking me about cuts. Like this episode suffered a lot of cuts because... I think it was like, we were like 30 minutes over. It, it was an incredibly long episode. It was great and it was very challenging to take stuff out because it was flowing well and the rhythm was right, but it was super long. So we had to take out stuff from everyone. So imagine how many things from Stingray was, was in that car. I do wonder, like, could, could we get like, uh, like uh, Joel's director's cut? You know, yeah. of the head of state. You just have to ask. ask I think if you have somebody in Sony, you probably get like the first cut of like extended scenes because it was, it like you know we we shot a lot that episode. Was what are some things you uh, remember that um, that you wish could have been in there? I think like uh, well, Chris's story was a little bit longer. And it had to go a little bit shorter. One of the things that I try to do in the episode, and you were talking about this, is uh, chosen. Like I wanted to give the false feeling that he was that he died. Right. And try to bring him at the end heroically out of the car, and we had footage for that. But like he just, uh, you know, it just didn't. Like some stories kind of ate it up, and then another thing we had is the kids. You know, the kids was long fights that we had there and I, to be honest everything that went away had to go away and i think that was the right call and the right decision as a director you're always like <laughs> you want like four hours of footage there but i think, I think as least, viewers we want four hours of footage <laughs> there's a lot there like in the future you'll be able to rescue a lot from this episode that this episode was massive massive uh let's see here uh we you, you you touched on the the fight with the kids, uh, Cobra Kai basically versus um, uh, Miyagi Fang. Uh, was there was there uh, with Mitch Mitch's reveal? 
was there any challenges to that scene in terms of like framing and just kind of getting it right to give us a sense of like, oh, wow, this is a reveal kind of moment? Yes. I think the that scene, the, that scene had a lot of choreography to it. Like, for example, when they're up the stairs, you know, they had to come down the stairs and then all the Cobra Kai's had to be lined up in a way that it was perfect for Mitch to kind of go from one side to the other. So Mitch coming to the other side and revealing was actually not complicated, but then you had to get, and this is one of the things in which we were talking about 20 characters. You had many characters talking and reacting on both sides. So you had Kenny and you had Sholo and you had a... you had, I think, uh, Tanner, and you had... Uh, Robbie, yeah, Robbie, uh, uh, Tori, um, Sam. Yeah, you, you had everyone reacting. So every time somebody reacts, that's a, that's a, that's a camera angle, that's a camera shot. Mm. So we had to choreograph it in a way that, you know, we were, like, trying to steal all those reactions while, while that was happening, and... And at the same time, you know, the feeling of that scene that we wanted was the same thing that we that we were talking about for the other episodes. You know, we want we want that to feel like a huge moment. We want this to feel like like an eye opening moment, not only for the audience but for the characters. So we wanted to portray that, and portraying that it's very time consuming and and it's very it takes a lot. <laughs> so. Yeah. And then that's happening on a day in which you're shooting this huge fight. So you probably have like 20 minutes to do it. So it's it's the same thing that always happens in every show. Yeah, I, I, I bet. I mean, that's that's what we continue to learn speaking with like writers and directors. Just, you know, uh, things run long and people run behind and there's things that you wish you can keep, but you have to cut because of runtime. I just wish, you know, like, and, and I get it because, you know, it, it it's, um, it's a pacing thing, right? Like you don't want certain things to get stagnant or you might oversaturate certain things like too much of Stingray might just be too much. You're, now you're, now you're taking this out of the moment when we're trying to go rescue the Russo or so there's, there's a whole like, um, uh, yeah, pacing basically. Now, and, uh, was it, th- this is also the, the moment where, um, or the, the same episode where, yeah, yeah, that's right. Daniel calls Amanda at home, and Amanda is with Carmen, and it's that's a very intense scene. Can can you give some insight to the, uh, filming that? Yeah, we actually filmed that like with I I think Carmen and uh, and yeah, Amanda yeah. shot it. I think like three weeks before we actually shot Daniel on the street. Oh, wow. Okay. So that was like very like we had they had to use the imagination for it and. Uh, and then we had the light of the car, which, you know, we kind of like were trying to uh, not give away the surprise of Stingray coming in. So it it was a lot of pieces. I think if if there's a way of describing this particular episode on the way it was shot, it was shot in pieces. It was like a piece here and a piece there and a piece there. And like one of the things, like all that Johnny and the mansion moment, and I know I'm going to another moment, but like if you see that big fight had f- five different parts and I shot one part and then Hayden shot a little bit part in the room. And then I shot the swimming pool. And then, and then at the same time, you know, while the swimming pool is happening, we had that fight on the other room, which also Hayden did it. So we were always coordinating with each other and the same with the kids. There was a part in the room on the, on, you know, Terry Silver's room and then another part in the, so, this episode was shot in pieces like no other episode. It was wow. like hundreds of little pieces put in together in the editing room. Um, for for the moment uh, where where the the Cobra Kai mobile pulls up to the Russo house and Amanda says it's Cobra Kai, how did you guys achieve the effect of the headlights coming to the house? Because that's the set, and so I know that there's no. Unless you guys brought a real car inside, there's no way that that's a real car. As well, at least I'm assuming, that was a trick. That was the yeah. light. Like we had the lights coming from the windows and from everywhere, and then like that was all a trick. And we tried to keep it simple because yeah. I think you know trying to kind of sell the drama and the tension out of the characters. That's what we did with them and what we did with Daniel. 
Yeah, I'll have to watch that again. But that, I, I, I only just thought about that recently. I go, wait a minute, that couldn't have been a real car, you know? Because you know, I wanted to make sure I get, get my notes right. Because there's no way they got a car in there. Because I, I know that's a set. So yeah, yeah no, that was a I had to place myself in there because I didn't, I, I didn't get to walk in the living room because, um, when, when I got to visit, it was considered a hot set because in a few days they they were going to be filming in the kitchen, and so I only got to, um walk around a little bit over where uh, there, there's like that little bridge and a pond or whatever it is. I walked in that area and I walked a little bit in the living room near like the LaRusso family picture, you know, and that, that was it. And Hayden wouldn't let us see anything else. <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, I, you can never get a car there. And and you know about the configuration of the two apartments, the Johnny yes. apartment, right? Yeah. That yeah. Well, it's the same thing with like when they introduced that that new tenant that stuck his head out of the door. I go, wait a minute, we're, that, that's not the way that that wasn't there when I was there. And people were, were messaging me, asking me too, like other content creators. They go, "Is there a stairwell?" I, I go, "I didn't <laughs> see one, but I think there's a reason why we don't see Miguel and uh, Robbie fighting on the stairs, and we just see them come up at the top, you know." So. Yeah, you, you guys were very, very clever with um with season five, and and again giving us very uh, familiar um filming locations that we have seen over the seasons, but giving us different angles and just making their world feel a little bit bigger. I think that's that's a challenge, and I, talking to other directors, like I, I don't know, speaking with Marielle or with uh, or with Jen or with Steven, you know, like we we always try to to tell the stories in a way that um, that you don't see certain elements. Like you always see what we're trying to portray. And I think that's the magic of camera. Like I couldn't, like the first time walking there, I couldn't believe that those two apartments, the Arecida apartment, I I thought the show was shot in Los Angeles. Right, right. I didn't know the show was shot in Atlanta until, until they called me for the season. I, like, I was like, how can you make that apartment of Reseda, which I've seen the exterior, like, how can you make it in Atlanta? And then when, and when I was in Atlanta, I was like, oh, it's because there's two. Mm -hmm. Two different locations. And I went to go visit the one in uh, Reseda as well. So I, I drove mm -hmm. around all uh, around the whole apartment just, just to kind of see uh, what, what it looked like. But yeah, it, it just, I, I love movie magic. So so there you guys, you, there you guys go. You know that the courtyard is in Atlanta, the exterior is in California, and and like the party sequence in episode nine too. It, again, it just makes their apartment feel that much bigger. The the, the, the complex because all we see is two the, the two doors opening. Nobody else opens up a door. <laughs> I think we should. I'll pitch an idea of somebody else opening a door. <laughs> I mean, I I'm still waiting for a mailman to deliver to their mailbox right there in the courtyard. Well, I, I'm, I, I'm just I, saying. I, I, yeah. I have a uniform. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk about Chosen versus Silver. So we start in the weapons room, and we end up uh, right outside. And there's that beautiful shot of Terry Silver's blade with the blood on it. Let's, yeah, to tell us all about that sequence. Yes, I think that that's one of the sequences that, yeah, that we work the most in the reference world. Like, it started, like... Um, we use the Grandmaster as a, as the reference, and the Grandmaster. Chan? And it, it's a, um, I think it's a Korean film. Oh, okay. And um, they have this kind of like slow motion and and like they have this rain sword fight, which is like one of the best I've ever seen. So we kind of like started working out of it and trying to do extreme details on it. So we worked like, you know, my wife and I started working with that and then we brought it to the stunt team and, you know, they created and crafted this choreography, kind of like the, we call it the grandmaster choreography. And we knew we were going to be limited on time. And also we knew we were shooting on a swimming pool in the valley. So the grandmaster is shooting on the streets of, <laughs> of this incredible <laughs> 50 years ago Korea or uh, I, I don't know. And with the rain, but we didn't have any of that, we just had a swimming pool. So we were like, what if we achieve these type of shots with this swimming pool? So we kind of brought the two of them like there and like we had those shots of like the water and the, the blood and, and uh, you know, we didn't have, it was actually, the Grandmaster is Hong Kong, it's not Korea. So okay. it, but you know, like we tried to kind of 
kind of like have that and just give our own valley version and use do whatever we always do, which is stakes go very high and use every craft and every element that we can to uh, to achieve that. But then if like like you always like if if in some of the shots you see the mansion there, so there's just like having a sword fight right here in the house next door. And so it's like always that contrast is that what made that scene so successful. And then we have that shot at the end, which chosen is like on the water with the blood spilling all around them. And, and it's a lot of blood. That, yeah. So that's the beginning of the journey of, oh, it's chosen dead. And uh, we wanted to kind of like have people feel for a little bit that he could not make it. Well, I mean, all all the um the setups pr- previously, especially with episode nine, you know, like uh, again, I was I I had this theory for the longest time, and so when we started kind of getting all these setups, I was like, oh my god, they're actually gonna do it. And then when we see the you know the big old slash across the back, like at that moment, I was like, I'm I was right. They killed off chosen. But also, I was very mad that I was right <laughs> because, because <laughs> you know he's my favorite character. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, I, what, what what an incredible scene! Um, did you see um, "Let's Be Water"? He, he's uh, the the account on social media. Did you see? I, the, I, I always follow them. You, you saw the, the the moving the moving water with the yes, stance and all that. Incredible! They, they do incredible stuff there. He's good. He's yeah. He's great. It's, it's amazing. It's uh, yeah. yeah it, I don't know. I don't know. He's creative, you know. Yeah, he just he, he has a brilliant mind. Shout out to Mark um, uh, at Let's Be Water. He was also our guest for episode five because that's his favorite episode. So I was like, dude, come on, come on the show, come on the show, and, and let's talk about episode five. Um, so take take uh, you directed you know this episode and and the fight sequence between Chosen and Silver. As a viewer, okay, so 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 put your um, uh, be in the shoes of, of, of a fan watching the show, and and right before Terry, well, what does he do? Does he? Let me see. So chosen trips Terry. Terry falls, and I'm I'm trying to remember how how does he get to the point where he cuts chosen? He's up, chosen is about to kill him, and then chosen hears he hear something. From- and as soon as he turns around, he slashes his back. Okay. And that's when he falls. From 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 laying down? Or does yeah. he get up? Yes, okay. no, he does it from laying down. Okay. So as as a viewer, um watching that fight, because there's a huge debate in the fandom, who do you think kind of won that fight? Like, you know, take away like the, the cut in the back because people are like, chosen one, but if he didn't get distracted by the sound, you know, because like because Terry Silver's already laying on the ground. So, like, but I can't say that's a win, but in, in your mind. I think, like, depends on what winning means. Like, if you, like, like, Chosen gets distracted by a moment of vulnerability. Like, he has a moment of, like, oh, he's hearing Johnny at the home. So, it's kind of like his weakness at that point is his sensitivity. He could... He could have, in my mind, he could have killed Terry there. And he had him ready to kill there. That's probably, like, by this point, I think I think Chosen could have ended that fight. And it's kind of like a similar thing that happened with Miguel and, uh, and Tanner on season two in which, you know, there's a moment of distraction based in, on sensitivity, and then Tanner takes advantage of that. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a little bit what's happening here. It's like, it has nothing to do with that, but at the same time, it's the same. The same. Right. Yeah, I, I love that. I've never even looked at it that way. Um, you know, Chosen Vulnerability, his, his friends, you yeah. know, and wh- whereas like Terry Silver is like, well, you know, he 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 would prefer to keep his enemies close than to actually have friends. I mean, look what he did with Degrees. His best, you know, his you know toxic best friend. You know, all these decades. So, um, yeah, that's that's very very interesting. So let's talk about you being able to film Daniel Larusso performing a crane kick. 
<laughs> like in the first interview, you talked about like, you know, Karate Kid was just one of those movies that was always on growing up. And now you got to actually direct the man who does the crane kick doing the crane kick to a very iconic villain. Yeah, that was that was a very nerve wracking scene. I remember the, 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 the I think everybody sure. was, like everybody was I don't know what everybody was doing. I think they were shooting something else. But everybody like the three guys, I think uh, um, Bob was with me. I think Joe and Luan came like my monitor had like eight people behind me. And we were all we were all there like that was the last minute of the day. And the crane, like we were like, oh, OK, is this crane kick going to work or not? Like we we were we had a time constraint and it was like it's probably our only shot. Like we had probably the last 20 or 30 minutes of the day to do this crane kick to be able to finish the scene. And we shoot it the first time. And I don't know, it was not organic. It didn't work well. And like we were when as a director when that starts happening you start feeling i I start editing in my mind like okay so what if instead of getting this shot i put the camera behind daniel so then i get the reaction of terry when he falls and i think the decision i made at that second was like i'm just gonna stay gonna give that uh, ralph two or three extra shots and usually ralph being a landmark of the show he has a lot of say and like he I take him very seriously when he says something and he said, like, just give me a couple of opportunities and I'll, and I'll do it. And I'm like, okay. So instead of like moving my camera around, I'm just going to stay there with him until he gets it right. And I think the second time we shoot it immediately, like that crane kick appears there. And I'm like, whoa, like everybody was like speechless. Like, because we were not prepared for it to work. Like we were thinking it was going to be like take three or take four. And like by take two, like, that's a very difficult, like seeing it there live is like, how can he do that? <laughs> like, it's, uh, it's very difficult. It's very, like, it's a, it's a lot of it. And I was telling you this episode was a lot about pieces. So that we had to come the next day and shoot like Terry's reaction and Terry falling to the glass door and all that. And so, we were piecing everything and trying to get moment by moment. That's how this finale ended up being what it was. So, so the crane kick, you guys filmed that over at least two days. So we shot the crane kick. We shot the fight choreography and the crane kick the first day, and then we shot Terry's reaction to the glass another day. Wow! Wow! Who am I? Yeah, the continuity is is, is fantastic because um you know like I, I think one of the the, the 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 things that happen often in TV television and, and film is um drinks you know like the continuity just getting that right but mm-hmm. uh, I I would be interested to go back and, and kind of just compare to see if there's anything just a little off but uh, even you know like uh, the makeup you know like the bloods and stuff like that. It'll be yeah. interesting. I had no idea. And, and for example, the, that same day that we did the kick, I think we also did Daniel reacting to Terry on the ground. But then okay. the shots of Terry on the ground were shot the set the next day. So sometimes this, you know, let like this shot here, this happened one day, and this happened another day. And right, no, you never the POVs, realize. right? The POV, yeah, yeah. So oh, okay. And and this episode particularly, it's full of stuff like that, and nobody can spot it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's good. That's good. Absolutely. Um, I mean, because like we only know from you guys telling us that oh, we're running out of time, this, that, and the other thing. Watching it, we would have no idea because the editing is great, and which I, oh god, I, I might be wrong. I feel like the editing has been nominated for something, but um, yeah, well, everything is. You guys are just pros. One of the things that I've learned the most about the guys and about the editors here is like some scenes, and if this has happened to me, you know, it happens to me in every, it happens to all the all directions. You always have a scene that you don't like or that you feel is a little bit weaker than the rest because of the way you execute it. The guys give so much eye for detail for the editing that they save every scene. So, that's one of the things that I've learned. Like they, they, they focus on pacing. They focus. They're very specific about the tone and 
that's what makes this show. And then you also have the the advantage of the, that that you can always have the '80s soundtrack, and you know that always kind of like fills the, fills the blanks. But editing is such a difficult craft, and the guys nail it very well. That's one of that's been one of the, my biggest learning path of this show. Like yeah, I, the, there's so many moving parts and action. I would imagine is is very very difficult. I think the only thing that I could think of in episode ten that has always stuck out, and I'm going to blame Bob for this because it's him. So it, there, there's a there's an editing. I don't. I don't want to use the wrong term. I don't want to call it. Let's call it a, an editing boo boo. But um, there, there, there's a, a like an angle change when when Bob gets out of the car and he crosses his arms at the next. You know what I'm talking about? No. No, but I'm going to tell him now. Yeah, but but he he, he gets out and, for that yeah. for the next years. No, but he, Bob gets out and he crosses his arms, and then the next cut is a different angle, and he's still crossing his arms. So it's a whole timing thing. But there's so many other people doing different things. But I, I, I caught that. I was like, okay, I noticed that, and that's not something I usually notice because I feel, yeah. But it, yeah, just a, a timing thing. But that's it. It's just very, very small. <laughs> So I don't want to keep you too much longer. So so um, as we uh, get ready to wrap up here to to to, to end uh, this conversation, uh, I would like your thoughts on the um, the the parking lot sequence. You know, because a lot a lot of people surprisingly, like I, I learned this after the show came out, people thought that this was possibly the end of the show. And I'm like, there's so many questions that still need uh, answered, but but we knew that there was probably at least one more season, but but it's filmed in 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 a way that looks like it could be the end. So can you talk about the discussion behind that? And you probably can't speak on it, but I'll bring it up just in case. There's a very specific framing in the parking lot where Daniel and Johnny are talking, and right behind them, Amanda and Carmen are looking at Carmen's hand. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the parking lot scene, that was actually the last scene I shot in Atlanta. And what we did there was, you know, we we used, it's the same thing with the reference again. We tried to do like a couple of oneers to kind of like have a nice vibe. Then they all got chopped up to, for pacing. But the idea was always to keep it fluid and, you know, that typical scene of like hot cocoa and like blankets. And, um, and Kyler <laughs> exaggerating a little bit with the story. Yeah. <laughs> so what we tried to do there was like to give closure to it, like to, to, um, I think coming off season four, season four ended up on a bittersweet kind of angle because, you know, we had winners yeah. and we had losers and we had a bunch of everything. And I know this one, everybody wanted this to end up a, a little bit more uplifting, a little bit, to feel a little bit more like an ending. And um, I'm, I cannot talk too much about what we did there. I, I The only thing I can say is like, yeah, obviously things were a little bit, there were more things happening there that at the end, you know, for timing and for pacing got cut out. And I think what happened after that is, you know, we have that scene up with, with Chris at the end. And right. I, when, when we were talking about timing, I was talking to the guys and we were all like debating about probably um, making uh, Chris a little bit shorter at the end, but we rescued all that ending with Chris to be, to kind of tell the audience like, this is not over. And so it's like, you end up on a nice note with all everything, you know, there, uh, everybody's, uh, you know, in a, let's call it like in a closure mode. And then, you know, you have that crease moment that kind of like keeps everything open. And it's like, oh, there's one loose cannon here. There's something that hasn't closed up here. And I think we always wanted to end in, with that note, kind of like anticipating, you know, there's a new season coming. <laughs> Now, uh, in the in the parking lot sequence, you said some were cut down. I don't know if anybody was cut out completely. Was there any other kind of conversations that was kind of um, wrapping up? Because uh, I interviewed um, Shane and Christopher uh, Lewis, the, the 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 Ginger Twins, and yeah. they shared that um, that that was uh, kind of, that that wasn't originally in the script, and that 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 Chris was uh, Christopher was given lines uh, in 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 the last episode. 
Yeah, that was, uh, I think the guys came that day and they, they, they were seeing, they saw my choreography and they're like, oh, we can stick that, this part here that, you know, it's been something that the audience, that, that the fans have been asking for so long and this is the time to give them the answer. So that, that, and that was actually something that was like, they knew it and, but that was on the day. And there was another thing that was got caught and I think some fans bought it, which is there was a scene of uh, Sensei Kim arriving with a bike and right, and, right, yeah. And then uh, you've seen pictures of it, so everyone's asking about that. And that was a very cool sequence, but it was so long the episode that things have to suffer and the yeah. story gets told anywhere anyway without it. But it was such a cool bite. Yeah, yeah, that's really awesome. Like uh, we saw pictures, and then I think uh, Alicia just just um, I think somebody shared that that photo recently and tagged her and was kind of asking about it. They're like, we want to see this. And she was like, yeah, you know, and she, she kind of gave her thoughts about that night too. So yeah, it, it, it sounded pretty badass. but that, that's funny. You mentioned the guys showed up and said like the, the fans kind of been asking for it because a friend of the show, Kristen Baldwin, who writes for uh, entertainment weekly, um, she reached out to me after seeing that. And she's like, did I miss something? You know, like about these two, like I, I feel there, there was something that I was supposed to know. I go, oh, I, I don't know for sure, but I feel it's kind of a joke because in the fandom, like we know they're brothers in real life, but it's never necessarily been established on the show. And and they, you know, they split up in season two. And so we, we kind of we're, 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 we're wondering, are, are they really brothers? And so that's what it was. And she wrote an article about it, too. So it was pretty cool. Yeah, I, I, I those are the kind of touches that I like, you know, like that usually happens on the show and it's like you know it, it's one of the fascinating things this is a very unique show to work on because you know they uh, they come up with these ideas and and they're very creative and their energy is very like creative oriented and and they take the fans into consideration in a lot of the decisions and that's pretty cool because you know it's this show was a show that when it started it just started as a, you know, like a very small show and and the fans kind of like brought it up and to see that they recognize that and that they, the conversations that happen with us when we're directing involve the fans means, you know, means a lot about them. And, you know, that's, it's, it's a, a very nice show to be involved with. Yeah, no, congrats on, on, coming back for season six again i'm uh i can't wait to see uh, what what they give you and all that but whatever it is i'm sure there's going to be some some beautiful sequences and also <laughs> some some kick-ass uh fight sequences too because that's that's that that's, it shows up on um a lot of your episodes so uh th thank you so much um you know for your uh being generous with your time letting me pick your brain and and i definitely uh, hope that uh, we can talk again after season six uh with it being the final season you know awesome i'm i'm here and i hope i could i, I answered every question you had and if not i'm around in the social media and I'm, i'll always answer well, there, there, there's one i think you you probably um cannot answer that that i did bring up so we'll just leave that at it because i asked vanessa about it too and we didn't talk about it <laughs> <laughs> so i guess we'll have to wait till season six to for everyone to see <laughs> right right that's it so uh i want to thank everybody for your guys's continued support if you guys haven't yet please subscribe to the podcast and the youtube channel and um and, and again if you guys haven't yet go back and check out uh joelle's uh, first interview just an incredible story uh leading up to him um you know joining the uh, uh the film industry so uh thank you guys as always and i'll see you next time